to the Evolvement Podcast with your boy, Nye, where cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and our financial future are the hot topics. That is the future. Thank you for tuning in. And now, get ready. We are going live in three, two, one. What is going on, everybody? What is going on? It is your boy, Nye, and welcome to another episode of Evolvement the podcast where we talk about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and the future of our financial systems. Shout out to our first sponsors, Casper Labs. Casper Labs is building a fully decentralized blockchain infrastructure that really focuses on high performance without compromising on decentralization or resorting to off-chain settlements. CBC Casper is a proof of stake consensus that provides faster, safer, and more energy efficient decentralized network consensus. As we've seen, one of the major issues with blockchain technology is most blockchains on the market today are not scalable. Without scalability, we face huge issues in terms of onboarding the next billion users into cryptocurrency. CBC Casper aims at solving this issue. If you want to learn more about Casper, head over to casperlabs.io. Shout out to our second sponsor, and our second sponsor is the Crypto Bridge Trading Competition. Here's a little bit more info from the man, Katoshi. Hey, pussy. Yes, I'm talking about you. Wake up. I'm here to show you an opportunity to make hundreds of dollars daily on top of your profits. The only thing that stands between you and those profits is me. Because you will have to beat me in the crypto bridge trading competition from June to the moon. I see you there. Don't disappoint me. See the link below and sign up right now. And this is another episode in our blockchain infrastructure series. And today I have a very special guest on my line. I have Andre. Andre is from Phantom. And, uh, and we're going to sit down, we're going to talk a little bit about DAGs. We're going to talk a little bit about blockchain infrastructure and, and really specifically what everybody or what you guys over at phantom uh are, are doing differently why it's unique but first off before we get into any of that andre what first off welcome man how you doing <laughs> thanks man i i appreciate calling you special like the only person that ever calls me special is my mom so you know that that really makes me feel very good <laughs> you're welcome man you're welcome <laughs> can you uh can you give a little definition or, or for the audience of like who are you uh how did you get started in crypto and 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 why why is this all really interesting to you yeah sure my man so my my history actually started um quite a little bit before crypto i've been in the tech industry now for just over 20 years um so i originally started um doing well i i i I first after my um, degrees did some lecturing for a while a lot of um, teaching at university and college Um, after that i got into building uh, mesh networks for vodacom it's a local telecom here in um, south africa Um, building mesh networks out in africa tanzania congo um, lesotho a bunch of different places Um, being very interested in that area and having heavily specialized in cryptography, moved into uh, mobile security, focusing specifically on cryptography. Uh, after that, swapped fields into big data, um, large volume cluster stuff, terabytes of size. Um, the big data sort of naturally evolved into AI. Um, so, so I ended up having these these subsets of tools being um, cryptography, being distributed networks, um, being distributed computing. Uh, and then when the blockchain space came around, these these skill sets I had previously learned very naturally lean towards this technology. So having been a technologist and, and one that likes to chase new technology, um, got very interested in the space, um, started teaching myself quite a bit, um, uh, kind of started doing code reviews and things on that principle that I published and some people read. I, I still don't really know why it's, it's, it's boring and drab, but still they, they seem to get value out of it. Um, and then just heavily indented into the space, specifically my, my, my area, if I have to say there's a field I'm very focused on and interested in is um, distributed consensus, um, which doesn't actually just apply to blockchain. The, the value there is, is in a lot of areas and we can unpack that a little bit later in the call. 
but the the fundamentals itself is used in 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 almost all industries currently, and especially when you start talking about big data, AI, machine learning, and and machine to machine payments, which is something that has to start coming out in the near future. Then then it becomes adding a lot of value. Anyway, I'm I'm droning on. Um, the the TLDR is lecture went into tech, have been in tech for the last twenty years, and now I'm building crypto and blockchain stuff. I like it. And how did you get involved with uh, with Phantom? What was what's your role in Phantom? Uh, uh, how did you get involved? And also, can you just give us a quick one on one on what is Phantom doing? What how are they doing something different in the blockchain space right now? Definitely. So, so I was, as mentioned, heavily indented in the in the distributed consensus space, um, specifically in something called asynchronous BFT. Uh, this is this principle. So, so normally with BFT, you you have to assume certain rules of of synchrony, and there's there's max timeout limits with how long a round can take and how long you can communicate. Um, again, let me know if we need to unpack that a little bit more. Um, my field was specifically looking at the asynchronous nature of this. So, how do you make it so that you can keep the communication secure, but keep it in, in unbounded time limits. Um, so a lot of the research I was doing at the time was overlapping with the things that the guys at Phantom were doing. Um, and they originally reached out to me and um, we had a few preliminary conversations where where it looked like a lot of the research was, was overlapping. Um, theirs was... To be fair, when I originally started, they're not as fleshed out. Um, so, so, so they had the conceptual ideas, but they didn't really have the the practical implementation ideas yet. Um, so, given where my research was at, and given that they had a need for it, we started collaborating in that space. Um, since then, you know, Professor Schultz from um, University of Sydney has come on board, um, and I mean, he's he's a fantastic expert in the field himself. Um, the Yonce team that came on board, um, Dr. Kwan that came on board. So, so we've we've got a very very strong pedigree of of researchers and professors currently all helping in that space. And and that's really the thing that that where Phantom differentiates itself is is in in this one area, which is which is the ABFT, which is the asynchronous consensus. Um, that's where its domain knowledge is. That's where its expertise is in, and, and that's what it's good at researching and engineering and creating frameworks for. Um, so I always have this problem in the space that you know everyone assumes that one blockchain has to be everything. You know you have to be. You have to be the wallet. You have to be the explorer. You have to be the data store. You have to be the security, the consensus, the token, you name it. Um, and this is actually a concept that really annoys me because you you, you don't need to be all of these things. I mean, a, a, a project like, like POA is fantastic at their infrastructure tools. So, you know, I prefer to use theirs. Um, Ethereum has a very good VM for the time, some design flaws, but I mean, that's being rectified as we speak. Um, you've got Phantom, which is fantastic at consensus. So, so what, what, what it's, what it should be versus what it's targeting to be. Those are two different conversations, but, but what it should be is a, a plug and play consensus module for, for any blockchain, really, um, similar to what Tendermint accomplished with Cosmos. So that you've, you've got this secure, scalable, fast, I say in quotes, because it depends on your specific vertical that you're building for. I mean, it's, it's fast when you talk about payments, but it's not necessarily fast when you talk about, you know, a, a Google st- style data infrastructure. Um, anyway, again, I digress, but it's, 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 it's really fast, secure consensus that's plug and playable on, on pretty much any chain or anything you really need it for. Um, because again, using an example of, of my field, um, when you look at if you take the, the, the 10 year or 20 year snapshot from now and we look at something like autonomous cars. So right now we have stop streets and traffic lights and robots and all of these things because it's, it's very primitive ways for us as drivers to be able to communicate with other drivers because we don't have another method of communication. With autonomous cars that one can locally communicate in a distributed fashion, all of a sudden that communication means you no longer need the traffic signs or the robots or all of these things. But communication itself isn't enough. They also need to be able to trust the communication that they're getting. So in a local cluster of distributed communication, they need to be able to reach fast consensus. 
And I say fast here because you're talking about cars, you know, traveling at, at 60, 80, 100 kilometers an hour. So it's, it's sub seconds that they need to be able to make an informed decision at a crossroad for argument's sake. So in these cases, again, the distributed consensus becomes incredibly valuable. And you, you need to start worrying about things like finality and throughput and the security of the protocol. So it's 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 not blockchain specific, even though it's definitely blockchain flavored and blockchain right now is definitely helping fuel the research and development in the space. Awesome. There's a couple of things that I really want to touch in on in that. And and uh, first thing I really want to like get clear on is I think you said that Phantom has asynchronous consensus. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. What is asynchronous consensus? What does that mean? So, so normal normal BFT is has has assumptions of synchrony. So, so, so the way a normal BFT protocol works, you'll have three rounds of commits. So, you'll you'll have a pre-commit round, which is sort of telling all of the other participants, "I'm going to be sending you something." Then you have a commit round where where after you've you've gotten everyone's agreement that you're going to send them something, you you actually send them the value so they can make their decision on it. And then you have your finalization phase. So so again, in this circumstance, it's similar to to let's say we have three participants. I need to to actively ask each participant. I'm going to send you this. Are you okay? Yes, you're okay. Then I need to ask the other one. I'm going to send you this. Are you okay? Yes, you're okay. And once I've collected all of those votes, then I can only move on to the next round. So that's the synchronous interaction. So everyone has to be in sync with each other. The asynchronous assumption is that A party and B party can communicate and B party and C party can communicate. And then the majority of the parties are aware of the communication, even though A and C never actually communicated with each other. The other assumption there is also that that communication can be lost. In a synchronous system, you assume that the protocol will only finalize when communication is finalized. So it waits until you've spoken to everyone. In an asynchronous protocol, it assumes that you're not always going to be able to speak to everyone, but you're going to be able to speak to some of the people, and the rest will eventually get the information, and a certain subset of that will simply be faulty, and you can't talk to them at all. So the asynchronous assumption is just a way – it's it's the difference between between – um, single and parallel processing. Uh, we, we, we first saw it in processors, you know, when we started having multi cores, where originally you had, you had a single processor and that single processor could do the work. So you could do a one plus one instruction. And if you wanted to do the one plus one instruction four times, then you asked it one plus one, it told you two, and then you asked it again, and you asked it again, and you asked it again. So it took four times the execution time. Then we got asynchronous processing or parallel processing, and now all of a sudden you can ask each one of the cores to do the processing, and they ret- and they return it to you in the time it takes for the slowest one to process the interaction. So it's 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 a method of of faster with also better fault assumptions in terms of of communication, processing, and overall agreement. So is it looking for agreement from uh, a majority of people instead of all the people and then the rest of them will eventually get it? Is that kind of the concept? Yeah. So, I mean, with with all BFT protocols, you've got this two in over three kind of argument um, that says that as long as, you know, 66 plus one of the network is aware of it, then you can assume that enough of the network is aware of it, that the rest will eventually also get up to speed. Um, that's that's more of its security assumption and less, less of its communication assumption um, the communication assumption says that that for us to all agree I don't necessarily have to talk to you so so to use that in an example um, again let's say there's three participants let's say there's you me and Michael uh, we need to decide where we're going to go have dinner tonight so so I say I want to go to restaurant A and I tell you, I want to go to restaurant A and you agree. Now you tell Michael, look, we're going to restaurant A. So now Michael knows three of us agreed. You know, two of us agreed and one knows about it. And I only know that I told you. So by virtue of this, I, I don't have the information yet. But the two of you already know we're going where we're going because you're aware that the majority is aware of this information. So by, by adding this concept of A sharing the information and B, sharing whom I've shared the information to, it allows the group to make decisions without the whole group needing to be informed. That totally makes sense. That totally makes sense. And 
I kind of want to get into the DAG side of things here. You guys, uh, uh, when, when I was reading up on it, it, it specifically says that you are uh, a DAG-based distributed ledger incorporating new methods of scalability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, before we get into all of that, what is a DAG for people that don't know? Sure. So uh, DAG is just terminology. It's called a directed acyclic graph. Um, so explaining that, because if you don't know what a DAG is, I doubt you know what a directed acyclic graph is in any case. So directed means it can only move in one direction. So, so let's, um, it's a little bit difficult to, to, to illustrate this without visual aids, but, but assume you have, assume you have object A and it has a little arrow to object B. Now, now directed means that it, A is pointing to B. So it's directed. Acyclic means that it can't in any way cycle back. So if you have A and it's pointing with a little arrow to B, it can't, it can move from A to B, but it can't go back from B to A because that arrow is only moving in one direction. If I now had another arrow from B to A, then it's cyclic. So then you had a cyclic graph. So we have directed, then we have acyclic, and the graph is just the, the, the object itself. That's, you know, A pointing to B is the graph. So a, a DAG is just any object where from any starting point, you can only move down in the graph, and it is a graph, and it's acyclic. So I can't at any point somehow loop back to my starting point, and that's really all it is. Um, and, and maybe to unpack that a little bit more as well, because there's this... There's, there's a lot of confusion about DAG, blockchain, the nomenclature, and all of these things. So, so Bitcoin is also a DAG because if you have block one and it's pointing, well, if you have block two and it's pointing to block one, since each one increments on the next one, then block two points to block one, so it's directed. There's no way I can get from one to two, so it's acyclic and it's still a graph. So the 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 big difference when people talk blockchain graph is actually based on the amount of leaves or, or, or vertices or nodes that you have. So in the, in the Bitcoin example, two points to one, three will point to two, four will point to three, and so forth. Um, three can't point to one because it has to follow on two. In the DAG example, that's not true. In the DAG example, two can point to one, and then three can also point to one, and then four can point to three, and, and you, can, you can basically just throw more blocks on top each time and you can you can grow out the leaves so that you you have more um so so the reason why why a lot of people are, are having this whole dag blockchain argument um not argument but but discussions that you know dags is the new waves is because dags again leans towards what i mentioned earlier which is the parallel processing because right now in something like in something like bitcoin you've 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 got the the other blocks so even though i proposed block two and it's pointing to block one i still have block 2b and i have block 2c but the longest chain rule means i need to ignore those and i simply throw them away the the dag rule is saying look don't throw those away because that's wasted processing power someone spent energy building that block so let's let's see if we can add it so instead let's add that block 2b that points to block one and let's validate that and let's make that part of our security model so it's, it's just a, a parallel processing method of changing the normal Bitcoin to something that can run across multiple systems. Um, so it's, it's at the, the CPU example I, I used earlier, again, comes into play because, you know, like, like Bitcoin and, and single flow blockchains, which are also just DAGs, they're really the single core CPU. You know, that's that's the first bit of technology that came out. And then we got to multi-core CPUs. And that's where we're at with DAGs now. That's the multi-core CPU. So it just allows you to not waste that extra energy you spent or that extra processing power and actually use those extra blocks to increase your throughput. And when you start doing that, you can start doing a few other sexy things. So for example, with a normal single um, single flow like Bitcoin blockchain, you can only propose one block at a time and you can only propose one block every 10 minutes. In a DAG solution, anyone can propose a block because the rest are eventually going to vote on that block. So even if you're a slow node and you got the originating transactions, 
you can still propose the block and it might take a little bit longer because your hardware or your network infrastructure isn't as good, but it won't be discarded just because you're running slower than the rest of the guys. And this way, the more nodes you add, the more blocks you can throw on top of this thing in real time. So, so it becomes a lot faster if you have more nodes and each one of them has their own originating transactions. The catch there is, is it does become slower when you have multiple nodes, but they don't have their own originating transactions because then they're just adding extra network overlay. So, so in all of these things, you know, there's always, there's always a trade-off. You're always going from the one end of the spectrum, be it throughput or security or decentralization. And you're, and you're just moving the needle a little bit to one of the other ones. But in, we've seen our requirement is low finality, high throughput, and that we get via parallel processing, DAGs, sharding, BFT, proof of stake, and adding all of these new wave of technologies in. We, we get to that second version of the original architecture. We, we get to the multi-core instead of the single core CPU. That's super interesting. I'm trying, trying to digest all of that. That's amazing. Um, really getting into the use case uh, behind Phantom. Uh, when I first saw it, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Like it's just a little mind blown of like what you guys are trying to accomplish. Like it literally says on your website, the nervous system for smart cities. Can you explain that a little bit? How is this playing into uh, smart cities, public utilities, healthcare, et cetera? So, so, so I, I have to be very clear and transparent on this one. I actually am not a big fan of that vertical, um, specifically because I actually think it's limiting the potential of the technology. Um, I understand why the business development team and the innovation team took that route. Um, it's an industry they know very well. They have a lot of context. They have a lot of business development already actively happening in the space. So, so a lot of their teams and projects were already doing blockchain-based POCs. So it was very easy to, to, to use, again, this distributed consensus technology as this baseline for this tech and then add a few other products on top of it. So, so one, of the, one of the key things there is when you're talking about something like smart cities, well, one of the first POCs is traffic management. So that's just getting as much data transcribed from traffic movement, um, you know, when's busy times of the day, when's slow, how, what does the robots do, and transcribing this data on chain. That's phase one. Phase two is then allowing other industries in the organization and government structures to have access to this data and to be able to, to, to start getting smart information from it, you know, whether it be route planning, whether it be um, network upgrades or, or anything else. I mean, even loosely connected things like waste management that connects to more optimized routes given in traffic based on the traffic signals. Phase three is opening it up to, to public consumption. So, so then you have a few tools built around it that allows public people to build smart things with this data, you know, because you, you never actually know what people can come up with if you just give them access to raw information and to see what they can see with that. Now, to accomplish this, you're talking about something that has a lot of information flowing through at very high intervals. So again, you need strong transactional throughput. You need strong security considerations because you don't want malicious traffic data. Um, and you need low finality because you want access to the data as soon as it becomes available. And again, the ABFT consensus really easily um, lends itself to this. The, the, the one concern there is that now you, you have a little bit of a new problem, which is, which is data, because you, you very quickly get into the data bloat problem where data is immutable and you keep storing it so it becomes infinite. So one of the things that, that we, we did do there was allow selective data consumption. So it's basically like subscribing to, to, to a, a feed or a stream where all of the data does still get pushed to specific archival nodes. But you as a consumer don't need to have all of the data because maybe you don't need the temperature information, but you only want the traffic light information and only in a specific geographical region. So your node then only replicates those transactions and you can set the filters of what you want and what you don't want. And this at least stops the data bloat problem. Because right now, if you look at something like Ethereum, you know, you're, you're copying over all of the data, whether you want to or not. Um, so so small technology shifts like that that make it appropriate for this nervous system narrative. Um, but saying that's the specific niche, that's, that's from a business development point of view. The, the technology itself, 
I'm I'm applying to 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 a lot more in terms of like I mentioned the autonomous vehicles. The other one we're strongly looking at is when you start talking about machine to machine payments, because um, this is something we're not really exploring currently. But but we're getting to this point where you're going to have an autonomous car that needs to go park somewhere and it needs to pay for that parking ticket now. Or, or you have a delivery drone that goes through private airspace and it needs to pay for going through that airspace. Now, it, it can't sign up for a bank account. It can't have cash in wallet, but it still needs a way to make a payment from it to the other intermediary. And now all of a sudden you need something like digital cash. And now something like a blockchain solution becomes incredibly important. But again, you need the high throughput, you need the instantaneous finality, because you can't exactly sit there waiting for 10 minutes while the Bitcoin transaction gets confirmed. So again, the ABFT lends it towards this, this new problem, which, which is, is starting to, to come, but isn't prevalent yet. Um, so anyway, I, I know I went off there on a tangent a little bit, but, but the, the, the nervous system for smart cities is really the focus in terms of it's one of the verticals of what this technology can accomplish. But, but I think it's limiting the scope of, of everything that it can actually do. I mean, it's super interesting, man. I, I like. I really want to chat with you a little bit about your vision of the future. You know, you, you've you've got uh, a, a very strong uh, stance and, and and knowledge and wisdom in terms of, of of what this technology has the potential be to be used for. But like, how do you see the future working, man? You know, you talk about autonomous cars, planes, other vehicles, things like that. In your eyes, in like. I don't know, 15, 20, maybe 30 years, what, like, what does the world look like to you? Like in, or what can it look like to you? Well, I mean, look, we're, we're, we're definitely moving towards a more autonomous um, and more, let's call it robot driven world. Um, I don't want to get too sci-fi on this topic, but um, we, we, we can see it in terms of, of delivery. We can see it in terms of supply chain infrastructure, um, more and more menial mundane tasks are being replaced by autonomous processes. Um, so, so we're getting to a point where for now the intermediary is still the human, but eventually the intermediary is no longer going to be the human and the, the, the machines are going to interact with each other directly and independently as they become smarter. The, one of the reasons that's currently not happening is because they, they don't have a shared protocol of communication yet. Um, you know, scripts, need to use things like like if this then that to be able to to intercommunicate with each other but we're getting closer to a universal protocol that allows communication between all of these entities so so to me this whole blockchain movement is actually really fascinating because bitcoin was started as a hobby it, it wasn't started as a fundamental solution to a problem no, normally when you see technological advancements it's because there's a big problem and then you present a technological solution for it. In blockchain's case, we, we developed the solution, but we don't have the problem yet. And, and that's why what we're seeing with a lot of organizations, you know, is they're, they're trying to sort of shove the problem on top of blockchain. And that, that's why we keep seeing people trying the same verticals. You know, we keep seeing supply chain. We see, keep seeing medical data, um, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, these are things that you can do in a normal database. You, you don't need to use a blockchain. In fact, using a blockchain for it is a horrible idea. It is a slow, encumbered, expensive system to use. So we, we have the solution for a problem that doesn't exist yet. But if you, if you look at that 50-year or even that 100-year picture, and you can assume this autonomous interaction world of, of interdependent entities, robots, machines, whatever you want to call them, that need to, A, communicate with each other in a local and distributed fashion, B, reach consensus on that information to ensure that there isn't a malicious party because there's financial benefit, and C, be able to transact in a financial level with each other, then all of a sudden Bitcoin becomes, blockchain specifically, becomes the perfect solution for this problem. So, so to me, it's, it's, I mean, every, everyone tends to say we're, we're early in terms of, of, of crypto. Um, and, and I don't actually think so. Like, like, like crypto, I think is, is in its time and people are doing exactly what cryptocurrency is good at, which is speculation and trading and absolutely nothing else. Because other than that, it's a waste, but blockchain where we're definitely early because we've, we've already built the solution for the problem that's going to happen in 50 years from now. I love that, man. I love that. That's super interesting. Um, 
random kind of off topic question. How do you think VR, AR and those and spatial computing and those technologies will kind of play into the future uh, in, into all of this? This is, this is something that I've, I've gotten super interested in too recently. I'm, I'm wondering if you have an opinion or perspective on that. I mean, I, I, I don't particularly see them as intermeshed with blockchain. But if you're if you're talking about a world where where more and more of basic human action and interaction is is displaced by machine to machine interaction, then you're talking about something that has more and more of a need for for escapism, for interaction, for for purpose. Um, and when you start talking about those things from a human nature point of view, all of a sudden things like VR and AR start becoming incredibly important because they're they're the strongest escapism tools we're going to have in the future. So the more the more you displace basic human purpose, which we know we need as a as a survivability mechanism, the more people will reach out towards things that do, and and not just you know in terms of like we do now with gaming or books, you 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 need full immersion, and for that that's VR and AR. So I think that's sort of going to be the the depression cure once the machines take over, um, and it's going to be incredibly important. And I mean, if you want to take it a little bit more dystopian than that, you know, you can start talking about like fully living in virtual worlds so that you don't even need to interact in this one anymore, um, which I think for some people is probably a, a fantastic cure for for their problems. So so definitely a very important part of the future ecosystem. But I wouldn't necessarily say it's tightly coupled to blockchain. Interesting, man. Very interesting. Well, I want to th- say thanks for coming on, man. This has been a really good conversation. Uh, um, I've personally learned a lot about DAGs and, and, and all of these different technologies that you guys are do- you're doing. You've got a huge vision of what you want to accomplish. And, uh, and I like it. I really like it. I think it's interesting. It's way different than everybody else is thinking in terms of blockchain technology. Um, got an extensive knowledge and and so yeah thank you for coming on the show man thank you for sharing uh with myself my audience all all the things that you're 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 building and, and, and your knowledge absolute pleasure my man thanks for taking the time appreciate it of course of course and before we get going can you just share with the audience a little bit about where they can learn more about phantom what you guys are building things like that Sure. I mean, phantom.foundation is the primary website. Everything sort of portals out from there. So, you know, wherever you want to go to the Telegram and, and interact with um, like Michael Chen, CMO, and some of the other community guys. Or if you're just interested in the research papers, they're all published there. You can just follow it to, to the Cornell's publication. Um, if you prefer the GitHub, again, everything's open source. Feel free to go download one of the nodes and play around with it. You can even do local installations with fake nets and just see how it interacts. Um, so start with your portal of Phantom Not Foundation and then just, you know, dwell, delve out from there to whatever vertical you're interested in. Awesome, Andre. Thank you so much, man, for coming on the show. Guys, this is another episode of Evolvement. Uh, thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. And we'll catch you next time. Thank you to our second sponsor, Unification. Unification is trying to solve the issue that enterprise blockchains face. Enterprises, developers, and users require the immutable function of blockchain without being subjective to market volatility. They do so by applying work chains, independent blockchains deployed via an expansion log. To learn more, check out unification.com. This has been the Evolvement Podcast with your boy, Nye. Thanks for tuning in. Head over to Evolvement.io for updates and join us next week for an all-new episode. Peace.